Tonight on Chapel of Poetry, on the prose edition, I'm going to do a reading from My Body is a Book of Rules by Alicia Washuta. And uh, Alyssa used to uh, host an open mic I went to. Uh, she was a host at, at an open mic I went to at the um, Hugo House up in Seattle, Washington. But before I begin, I want to draw your attention to my shirt here. And this here is um, the Young Turks. And the Young Turks is one of my favorite programs to, uh, or, or, or where I get like news commentary and commentary on what is happening in America today or the world today. And in this shirt we have Cenk Uger, who is the owner of Young Turks, and Anna Kasparian, one of his, uh, his journalists who works for, and they are the forces of light. And, and they, with the force of light, the force of real journalism, they can trump Trump, who is the, the force of of the evil of America. The evil oligarchy who wants to rule over our great country. And so let's start right with this and start with a Cascade Autobiography, part four. When I was five, my kindergarten teacher split the class into pilgrims and Indians with construction paper costumes to teach us about our national heritage. My parents had explained to me that I was an Indian, and the classroom taught me what that meant. When I was six, my dad taught me how to spell cowlitz, C-O-W-L-I-T-Z, and I wrote it at the bottom of my drawings. When I was seven, I became obsessed with mermaids, certain that I could fuse my legs into a fin if I pressed them together firmly enough under my modest sub-desk plaid. At eight, I created diplomas of buildings where other Native people's ancestors slept. And though the teacher told me this was my heritage, I was not certain that I believed in cacti or messes, having never seen them. Number 22. I want you more than I have ever wanted any bartender. I see you twice a week at karaoke. Your aqua de gale cologne of choice of frat boys pokes into my scent memory. We flirt for weeks while I watch you charm the customers. We have a couple of platonic f feeling dinners that I wish were real dates, and I learn that you hate the bar, hate flirting with men for tips, but the unspoken truth is that you're not skilled at much uh, and your body is compact and hard. I tell you I'm going to teach you about how to write essays for your community college class, but instead we get trashed and you take me home. You do me for five hours. We only rest when you go outside in your boxer briefs and piss on your neighbor's house. You keep doing me long after my vads turns into baguette crust. When you slur that you love me, I tell you to shut up and come. I tell you I'm taking your studded belt, and if you want it back, you will come to my place. All the bar patrons, patrons have seen the belt circling your waist like Saturn's ring. This trophy lies on my bedroom floor while you tell me 12 hours later via text that you made a mistake, that we should never speak of again. While I drive around at night wishing I had never been born, I give you my order at the bar and pretend for your sake that we have never make, met. In a few months, we are pals again on the bar's anniversary night. I pass by as the 
fleet of bartenders and barbacks gather on the sidewalk for a photo. You wear cross trainers with your tux like a boy going to prom. And for the first time, all my attraction is gone, and I almost love you like a sister would. When you tell me that you got so mad at your girlfriend that if you were gay and she were a dude, you would have hit her for sure. I have to stop with the love. Number 17. For my 23rd birthday, two days after, after Thanksgiving, most of my friends are out of town, unavailable to celebrate, so I decide to settle for a one-night stand and a buck back rub. A friend and I go to a hipster bar where sombreros and flake, fake flowers decorate the ceiling. Over dinner earlier, she told me I am good at making sultry eyes, so I practice this tonight. I catch your attention. You buy me a drink, and I invite you home. I have condoms and lube beside my bed, and you say I'm very prepared. After my back rub, we have a quick missionary sex. Afterward, in the bathroom, I cannot... I find blood on the toilet paper, blood on the condom, just a little. This is not my period. Not since my first time have I bled like this. At seven, you ask for directions to the bus stop. We avoid exchanging numbers. We don't kiss goodbye. We smile and say, see you later, even though we won't. All day, I feel strange about how good the downstairs door sounded when it shut behind you and how much I believe your kind goodbye smile. In my apartment, there is no trace of you but the shriveled, redden condom. You never existed. Number 15. On our third date, I summon the courage to ask your last name, but I still do not ask your age. You say... You walk with your hips forward because it makes walking easier. When I first saw you stacking glasses behind the bar at the Crescent, I was quite sure I would never rip off all your clothes. I was right. We strip separately, me, then you. When you end it, you admit that you are 34, and as though it's nothing that you are 12 years my senior. In the months after, we see each other a few times around Seattle and pretend we never met. When I see you on a bus, I sit across the aisle from you, you, you never turning my head to look. My peripheral vision provides glances at your leather sneaker on your knee, your green knit cap, but no explanations of what I was lacking, what in me could make you turn to stone when you look back to me. Months later, I will duck into a used video game store at the university and see you behind the counter. While I browse in silence, I think of your dump of a place, your college hippie chick tapestry covering your bedrooms, French doors to offer privacy from your roommate, your mattress on the floor. There was no lack in me. There was nothing more in my than my tendency to choose the grit-coated seraphs out of whom I had no business trying to force love. I leave without buying anything, say thank you and never see you again. Number 14. We meet at Melvin's show downtown and you kiss me too much, too publicly. I have a yeast infection, but a girl cannot tell a, tell a boy she has a yeast infection, so I let every, so I let every thrust, thrust hurt badly. When I drive you home to the other side of the Seattle, you point at the board. You point at the broad white horizon and say, the mountains are out. Number 12. All my friends are drinking because I am about to leave Maryland for good. In the woods behind the party, you kiss me through a spider web. I am obsessed with the gap in your teeth. You have whiskey dick. You have whiskey dick in my bed and say the feeling of my fingertip fingernails is inconsequential. 
I keep saying, you're so hot, you're so hot, because I don't know how else to say that. I don't even care about sex. I just want to stare at that gap in your teeth and listen to your voice rumbling over it. Once you get up, I feel too bad to put a condom on it. Two days later, I load my boxes into my dad's truck and unload them in New Jersey. In the month before my move, I separate proper adult clothes from hoe gear and put the latter in the boxes in the attic. Now I'm an adult. I take clop canopin every night to sleep. Soon I will shed my old life like cicada's brittle shell. Number three. You tell me sex is funny and it's okay that my boyfriend is knocking on the window. You'll go. Number one. I have given hand jobs, blow jobs. I have eaten, been eaten out and fingered. I have tried to fuck, but I was too dry and tight, and my high school boyfriend was too gentle to push. To be a virgin at 20 is to be in danger of being a virgin forever. My vagina feels sealed shut. Even using tampons is impossible, so I tell you, we have to take it slow. You are the last man to know this. To, you are the last man to whom I say this. You stand above me and jack off onto my belly and breast. You demand that I blow you and that I immediately brush my teeth afterwards. You want a naked sleepover. I agree to all these things. I do not agree to what comes after. I get the morning after pill at the university clinic. When I cannot stop crying, the doctor says that this boy may have taken advantage of me. I reply that she just doesn't know the complexities of this exact situation. I take a handful of free condoms. I bleed all day. When I get back into the bed that used to be for sleep. I play the scene over in my head as though I could improve upon it in my thoughts. But still, in every remembering in the middle of the night, you are on top of me. Still, every time I say no, you say yes, and to you it is nothing but a difference of opinion. And that was a small selection from Elissa Washuta's book, My Body is a Book of Rules, and I'll place the, uh, the link to where you can find this book on, um, online. And um, as you can see, it is very well written, and she's a very good writer, and I suggest uh, if you have the uh, $17 that you get it. Thank you. Good night.